Umbra Overture Game Review. Philip receives a letter from his dead father, and instead of going to a small vacation town, he goes to northern Greenland because that's where the notes left by his father in a bank lead him. It doesn't take him very long to get a bit lost, and he finds himself in a hatch underground, albeit with no machine where he has to punch in some numbers for it to eat up an entire season of an otherwise pretty promising show. He immediately realizes that, hey, maybe I shouldn't have gone here, but hey, hindsight is 2020. This is a first-person point-and-click adventure survival horror game. The point-and-click adventure genre has not been doing all that well since, you know, the whole 3D thing and other, you know, there have been some attempts. But this one really does come up with a pretty good solution, something to make them pretty relevant. There is an entirely, nearly entirely, realistic physics engine involved here. The game is almost entirely centered around puzzles, and there are a ton of them, and most of them are pretty good. And the majority of them are based around your physical interaction with the environment, which is pretty... pretty vast. We... for, for example, if you want to pull a drawer out, you don't just click it. Like in a lot of games, you have to pull it out with the mouse. You know, grab it like you would with your hand, and then pull the mouse back towards you. And you can then close it again by grabbing it and pushing the mouse forward. This is also how you use your melee weapons. There are no guns in this. You swing them from one side to the other. You literally, you know, press the mouse key to indicate that you want to use it, so you're not just constantly accidentally swinging. Although, I hear some couples do enjoy that sort of thing. And, you know, pull it to one side, and the weapon will do so, and then pull it swiftly to the other side to hit with it. You can also pull it down to do a forward thrust with the weapon. The, the enemies are not great in amount, variety, or design. This is not really going for that sort of thing. Any pure survival horror action game has it beat in that area, but this isn't really going for that. The enemies that there are all play on primal fears. For example, you are pretty much stalked by these feral dogs with glowing, I suppose, yellow eyes. I never really wait around too much to, you know, look at them. Now, you can try to kill these. You can kill some of the enemies in the game. But, once you start killing a feral dog, excuse me, for example, you're kind of committed to it, because if you just wound it, it'll try to run a little distance away, and then it will howl. And yes, that will attract others of its kind, and suddenly you're fighting three or four instead of just one. And they take a bit of a licking to get completely dead. Now, the game in general does go for these very instinctive fears. It plays on, you know, obviously with you, you know, from pretty early on, you're underground. And from there, 
you don't exactly go up. You go further down into this installation, this mine that you find yourself in. So there's obviously the fear of being buried occasionally. The game will remind you of this by having, you know, some a minor quake, I suppose, or, you know, some shaking and, you know, you fear the whole thing will you know, cave in on you. It plays on the fear of freezing to death, obviously, with the environment, being eaten, the fear of heights, claustrophobia, and there are more that I will not go into here. The the levels are entirely linear, but you kind of forget it because the game is very gripping. It has a great atmosphere, mainly built by the isolation and the great sound side of the game. You know, where Silent Hill has characters to explain most of what you find out in this game, you find out by, you know, notes of paper left over by people who, you know, might not be around anymore. And they might even give hints as to how they died. And you might find, you know, not so much bodies, because those feral dogs have a bit of a habit of eating people but large quantities of blood. So there isn't a lot of voice acting, but what there is, is great. The writing varies a tad, but it tends to be really, really good. It is also a tad pseudo-intellectual at times, using big words where smaller ones might have sufficed. The storytelling is done by, you know, with pans across stills and voiceover, and it is pretty minimal. In general, a lot of the things in the game are quite minimal. There's no HUD, although you can tell when you're being hurt and if you're losing blood and such. The inventory does have, you know, your standard, you know, health level indicator borrowed pretty directly from, you know, the Resident Evil series. Although it's a, a picture of a figure instead of, you know, the pulse beat. The controls are pretty streamlined, quite Assassin's Creed style streamlined, with every key has one function or one overall kind of thing. You know, the mouse is for looking around and interacting with your environment, whether you're attacking or, you know, opening a drawer or something like that. Another important thing to note on that. There is actual gravity in this. You can... If you find a closet that's been knocked over, you can... If you begin to open the closet doors, if you don't open them all the way, gravity will pull it shut again, and you have to open it over. And in general, things have weight to them. You know, you don't feel like you're just a good example here is, of the opposite, is Half-Life, where anyone who's played Half-Life know that when you're moving boxes, you move them at pretty superhuman speeds, you know, you can pretty much, you know, send them skating across the ground as if they were a hockey puck or something, you know. In this, you move them gradually, especially, you know, if they're heavy, if it's a man-sized, you know, can of something, whatever, 
you can, you know, slowly move it, some you can knock over on their side, you know, and roll if it's a cylinder shaped. And, you know, you really feel like you're there. Although it is worth noting that Philip does have inhumanly long arms. Maybe he's Ben Murphy. The story is a tad vague, although it is worth noting that this is only the first chapter, and there's another chapter and then an expansion pack. So maybe those will change this, but for now, I've only played this first one, it's a pretty vague story overall, you know, it leaves you with more questions than answers. I think different players will come up with different theories as to what exactly is going on. Again, this might change with the next two titles, but I do think that this is interesting. There, there will be those who feel that this doesn't supply enough answers. Again, maybe this will change in the next two. But I do think it's quite interesting when you get to come to your own conclusions. And the game certainly never really comes out and says something. It only hints. The game does not have a lot of replayability, and it is kind of short. Once you've figured out the various puzzles, that's kind of it. You know, you spend... I guess the length of the game will almost depend on how quick-witted you are when it comes to video game puzzles. There are three difficulty settings, and in addition there are, I think, two other settings that you can turn on or off that will make the game harder if they're off. But I don't see a lot of people, you know, replaying this over and over. The game tends to be pretty difficult, you know, especially when dealing with the enemies. It can often be smarter to hide or run from them, you know. But don't let yourself get cornered. And don't run into a large metal container if something is after you because it'll guard the door. The AI is pretty good. The There are a couple of really intense... I mean, in general, when you deal with enemies, the game is intense, but there are a couple of very, very intense portions where you, for example, have to flee an enemy or, you know, an, an overpowering amount of enemies or a an enemy that you can't fight, something like that. And you have to, you know, lock doors, block doors, cause cave-ins trying to run away from this. This is one of the most awesome parts of the game. It is incredibly intense and a lot of fun. The game uses checkpoint saving, so you seldom have to replay very much when you die, and you will die. Especially if you yourself make sure to actually save when you find the things you save at. I'll give away what they are. Now, Sometimes the game also auto-saves, and sometimes it will auto-save at the beginning of one of the aforementioned very short, intense chases, or the like. And this means that you don't have to, you know, get through all the boring stuff that you already know how to do to get to the very tough one, because you might, you know, not yet know exactly how to get past the tough area that's very intense, you might, you know, need to practice some parts of that. And I say kudos to the developers for not forcing us to go through all, you know, the boring stuff just to get to the part we haven't completed yet. 
Now, as far as hiding goes, the game has this function where it gives a blue tint to your vision whenever you crouch. Especially if you aren't moving, it gets more and more blue and thus lets you see in the dark. I think this is supposed to emulate... The game came with no manual, so I have to make my own conclusions. Although the game does tell you pretty much how everything functions within the first five minutes, and then you don't really wonder after that point at all. It's very easy to get into. I think it's supposed to emulate kind of, you know, using your intuition, you know, and feeling your way, you know, through the darkness. Because, you know, we all know if we've been in darkness, you know, once you're there for a little period of time, and especially if you have seen it with some light, and if you have to move, we can sort of find our way, you know, if it's not a labyrinth we're in with no light. Now, that does, of course, also mean that you do have light sources of your own. However, these attract your enemies, like moth to a flame. So you don't want to be using them when there are enemies around. The light sources are the flashlight, which provides a great amount of light, and you can direct it you know, using the mouse. Also note that you can carry a light source in your left hand and a weapon in your right, and thus use both. You know, direct the light source with the mouse, and attack by, you know, using the keys on the mouse. Yeah. The Yes, the flashlight, which gives a great amount of light, you know, for the, for where you point it. But it uses batteries, and it's an old flashlight, so it uses batteries pretty swiftly. It does seem like you sometimes regenerate some battery power, and you can also find batteries as you go along through the game. There's your glow stick, which... I didn't use for long enough to see if that like runs out or what, but it really does not give a lot of light. Only pretty much where you're standing, you know, the very basic, like if you're standing pretty much up against a wall, you can check out that wall using the glow stick. And then there are flares which you have to find, and they are obviously quite finite in amount, and you know, basically you can you know, activate one and then you can run around with it, or you can throw it somewhere. The lighting is as great a feature as the physical, you know, the realistic physics of the game. There really are realistic shadows, and, you know, the light really works as it should. And you genuinely feel like now, this is something I've been missing in a lot of survival horror. You really, yourself, have to provide the light in an area. There isn't, like, just enough light that you can tell. There are a few areas where there is, but usually you have to use a light source or, you know, be really good at seeing in near darkness. You know, you have to remember this, the place you're in, isn't being used, so it's not like, you know, people have been making sure that the lights worked and such. Now, the... This also does lead to a few really great spots where suddenly there's a lot of light, you know, and it's almost like unpleasant, you know, like, you know how, you know, if you wake up in the middle of the night, you don't want to turn off, turn on too much light because it'll like, you know, bother your eyes. It's kind of like that. That is pretty cool when a video game can do that. Now that covers every aspect, I believe. So, hope you enjoyed it.